today on The Novelizers. Internet personality, Tony Zaret. Orange is the New Black's Michael Torpy. Plus, Hannah Pilkis and intern Kevin Carter. Now, here's your host, Andy Richter. Hi, this is Andy Richter. Today, I have a tale of my own to tell. One day, I was walking down the street when an alien jumped out and tried to eat me. Did I scare you? Well, of course not. That's because I was using words, and everyone knows that words aren't scary. Movies, on the other hand, can be really scary, and nobody likes that. In the movie Independence Day, scary things happen all the time, like when that alien jumps out and tries to eat Will Smith. I mean, a lot of people got really scared when that happened. Here on The Novelizers, we would never do anything that mean. We take movies like Independence Day and carefully remove all of the scary sounds and pictures, replacing them with soothing words. Then we have some of the least scary people in the world read them to you, resulting in the completely harmless podcast you're listening to right now. We call it The Novelizers. On this season of the podcast, we're novelizing the horrifying movie Independence Day. And here to tell you all the creepy things that have happened so far is my intern, Kevin. Kevin, where are you? Boo! Ah! What the fuck, man? So, sorry, sorry. I, I just I just thought, you know, because you, you were saying about words not being scary and all, and I'm just... That's not cool, buddy. Not cool at all. S- sorry. Uh, so, anyway... The Earth was totally fucked up by an alien invasion. America tries a bunch of things, but nothing works. Finally, some IT guy played by Jeff Goldblum comes up with a plan to put a computer virus in the alien ships. But this is before Wi-Fi, so they have to fly up there and stick it in the ship themselves with the help of Will Smith. Enjoying the Novelizers? Help us keep the magic going by visiting thenovelizers.com to reach our Patreon page, kick in a few bucks, and get access to tons of bonus content like extended interviews, outtakes, and more. Or spread the word by following the Novelizers on Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, I'm still calling it Twitter, and I always will. To advertise with us, email thenovelizers at gmail.com. Now, back to the show. Okay, today's first chapter was novelized and narrated by the Internet's own Tony Zaret. Tony, novelize us. Chapter 17, the Apple PowerBook 5300 CE. Novelized and narrated by Tony Zaret. Gray, do you read me, said the president, sitting in his jet fighter. Yep, the president was going to fly a jet fighter. Seems crazy, right? After all, the Cheeto-in-Chief can barely drive a golf cart without making a huge mistake. That's right, Drumphy. This is how a real president does it. Believe it or not, kiddos, there was actually a time when the president could fly a jet fighter into an alien flying saucer, instead of flying the whole country right into a dumpster fire. Or should I say, Drumpster fire? But... Enough political satire. If you want a hilarious take on the dumpster fire that is Washington, D.C., you can tune into Patriot Act with Hassan Minaj and watch him roast the drumpfer like a chestnut on Christmas. Or so I've heard, I'm too mesmerized by Mr. Minaj's fit physique and beautifully coiffed hair to pay attention to what I'm sure is his gut-bustingly hilarious political commentary. But as I was saying, The president sat in his jet fighter getting ready to join Captain Stephen Hiller and David Levinson in their fight against the aliens. But it wasn't going to be easy. There were only 26 minutes left before these space bugs lit our planet up harder than Hassan Minaj roasting the commander in Cheeto. As Stephen joyfully used his pilot training to fly an alien rocket ship into space, David used his skills as a big-time computer geek to tap away on the keyboard of his Apple PowerBook 5300 CE laptop. These PowerBooks were notable for being the first to feature hot, swappable expansion modules for a variety of different units, such as zip drives. Fortunately for David, the batteries on the PowerBook 5300 provided power for up to four hours of work time. So he wasn't worried about having to change his laptop using an incompatible alien power outlet in the time it usually takes to make the journey into outer space to win a war against aliens. So that was the good news. 
The bad news? The aliens were using some kind of magnet to suck David and Steven into their really big alien mothership. Oh no, said Steven. Don't worry. I was counting on this, said David, as he knew the aliens were going to use a magnet or something to pull the space rocket Steven was driving into their big alien mothership. When the hell were you going to tell me, said Steven. Oops, said David. Uh, we need to work on our communication, said Steven. And it was at this point that the film's audience let out a nice chuckle as this kind of quip is usually reserved for married couples in situation comedies, not astronauts riding in a space rocket to save the world from aliens. Meanwhile, back on Earth, the president and his fellow jet fighter pilots were heading right for the giant flying saucer that was hovering over the desert. We need to stop this threat, said the president, but enough about Trump. It's time to blow up this alien flying saucer. Not yet, replied General Gray. Not until the package has been delivered, saving our planet from these disgusting creatures. But enough about the Mueller report. Don't shoot at the flying saucer until David uploads a computer virus into the other alien rocket ship that's up in space. You see, the term delivering a package was being used as a secret code to keep the aliens from knowing that subhumans were going to fly into their mothership and upload a computer virus using the powerful productivity tools available to anyone willing to spend $6,800 approximately 13000 in today's dollars, on a PowerBook 5300 CE Macintosh laptop from Apple. Up in space, David and Steven got sucked further into the giant alien mothership. They were nervous because the alien mothership looked pretty scary from the inside. It was full of weird-looking aliens. Like, really weird. I mean, the whole thing looked like something right out of Star Wars. Fortunately for them, they were being dragged right into the part of the mothership where they could upload their computer virus so they didn't have to worry too much about finding their way around the cavernous steel behemoth. As they drifted toward the location of the mothership's main computer terminal, Stephen got nervous because he thought the aliens were going to be able to figure out that there were some good-looking humans driving the spaceship they were bringing in instead of disgusting aliens. But fortunately, David closed some gates over the spaceship's windows. Because while the aliens might have been able to figure out how to travel millions of light years through outer space, there was no way they would be able to invent something as sophisticated as the X-ray scanners humans have been using in their airports since the 1970s. David got out his Apple Macintosh PowerBook 5300 computer, which was fully loaded with all the tools needed for productivity and creativity on the go. And lucky for him, he was able to log into the alien mothership's main server using a rudimentary text-based interface, as the code for the computer running the intergalactic spaceship was all written in English. He uploaded the virus using a program called Virus Transfer that even featured a cute little image of a pirate flag. Due to the blazing fast 300 megahertz PowerPC 600 processor that came standard with the $6,800 PowerBook 5300 CE model, David was able to complete the virus upload in under 40 seconds, something that would have been impossible with an IBM-compatible laptop, making the PowerBook 5300 CE well worth paying nearly double the retail price. The president and his team of fighter jets were now ready to start their attack. In other words, it was Mueller time. Thanks, Tony. Each week, my intern Kevin interviews someone who worked on the actual film Independence Day. Kevin, what do you have for us? I am here with the lovely Roxanne Spam Can. You heard it, Spam Can. And she's in charge of the walkies, the beepers, the phones, all the audio from the movie Independence Day. Roxanne, how are you doing today? Oh, it's phenomenal to be here. How are you? I'm doing phenomenal as well. That's that's a great way to start the the, the interview when someone say how you're doing. I'm doing phenomenal. That's very that's very good. Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that. And you know, and you can can you hear me okay? I can hear you wonderfully. Basically, yeah, I'm gonna just come right out. What 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 is it you do on the um on the set? Yeah, I like to call myself a communication sergeant. I'm I'm really in charge of of, of phones, beepers, walkies, right? So PBWs, making sure that the phone, you know, we were using a lot of phones with cords, making sure they're untangled, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that we have the proper phone for the proper scene, really doing, doing, doing it justice. You know, you're working in the Oval Office, you're working in a fighter jet, you're going to need it. You're going to need a different type of phone people walkie. Um, so like, you know, what I like, what I like to do is when I watch movies, I like seeing behind the scenes and the bloopers and like, because it's, it shows that even though there was serious moments in the movie, these people had fun. They enjoyed yeah, each other. Absolutely. They loved, um, 
do you do you think it's possible that maybe because to me I, I think like being a, a phone a PBW sergeant on set would be kind of stressful right for the, was, that, was that the case or was everybody okay with it well you know what you know what obviously this movie's very serious this is not a comedy that we're working with but you know we were laughing you know who loved to do prank phone calls Jeff Goldblum and Vivica Fox classic so Classic. they were they were keeping us hooting and hollering the whole time. You know, they're doing mm -hmm. they're yelling cut after this riveting scene, everyone's in tears, and then and then they're doing crank calls. They're going, you know, you know, is your refrigerator running? Well, you better go catch it, kind of things of that nature. Yeah. We were laughing. <laughs> did they did they do that joke specifically? Because that's yeah, uh that's the first time that joke was ever said, actually. That was it was on the set. Makes sense. That was almost 30 years ago. Yeah, it makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah, it does line up historically. Yeah, it's amazing. Like being on on set with the as a PD, PBW is 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 it stressful for your job? Like is is people like because you say about cords all over the place and everything like that? Because I'm assuming they're not actually saying anything on these phones, you know, saying anything like that. So like, is, is it a stressful job for you doing that? It's absolutely really stressful. You know, I'm working in the technology space, and in addition to sourcing the phones, beepers, and walkies, I'm also directing these actors on how how they're using the phones, which can be incredibly stressful. You know, this is a very high stakes film, so there's a lot of different ways you can use the phone. You know, when there's the phone where you, you receive bad news and then you hold the phone to your heart and you hold it for a while and you really think. You know, there's that kind of phone call. There's the phone call where you say, I need this, that, and there's the phone slam. So there's really a lot of different, there's a lot of different tension that's carried in the hand when you're holding the phone. And, you know, not, not everybody was getting that. You know, Bill Pullman had a really hard time with the phone. And uh, we had to actually put a double in for a lot of his phone call material because he just was not, we didn't see the tension in the arm. And, and that was, that was pretty stressful for us. We almost recast them. So how, so how how did you get into this career then like 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 okay let me ask you this what were you, what were you doing and how did you get the job of Independence Day like what what, well, what happened amazing. with that you know I started off by lying I lied a lot I lied about how much experience I'd had mm -hmm. I would I would sort of crash set sets I would I would crash sets I'd show up and I and I'd say you know I'm here I'm craft services so I started off I I, I went to the uniform store I bought a chef's hat and I bought an apron I said I'm craft services. So that's how I kind of, and I studied people. I studied and I watched and I lied. I lied a lot. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, the food's ready. And I brought TV dinners and I, and I faked myself as craft services. Next, the next thing I, I, I did some background work and then I thought, okay, it's time to, it's time to, to, to graduate to something a little bigger. And actually Independence Day was my first real, real job as a communication sergeant. But, you know, fake it till you make it is what I always say. And, and, and I always say lie. A lot of people say, tell the truth. I say, for what? What are you going to tell the truth for? Just lie. Exactly. I, I agree with you. I, I tell people all the time when they try to fill out a resume, I'm like, listen, they're lying on what it is that they require. And you're going to lie about what it is you can do. We're oh, all absolutely. lying. Who cares? Oh, my Just God. Give oh, my God. You give me a temp job. I'll, you know, I'll download Excel. Give me a give me an assistant job. I'll figure out how to work a keyboard, you know? It's just, it's, it's okay. Just lie. Just lie. And I, when I heard, uh, they said, this is West Wing, but aliens, I go, yeah, I'm going to be there. All right. I'm going to be there. You know, listen to your story. It, 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 to me, it reminds me of like the true, the true American dream, right? Yeah. You, you lie to get in. And then once you get in, you work hard to get what you want. Absolutely. You know, you know, I'm not inept. I, I taught myself some new skills and made a lot of friends. And then those friends recommended me for other jobs. So, you know, in a way I lied for starters, but I, I was there for keeps because mm -hmm. of my character, because I'm yeah. a really, you know, I wouldn't say a likable person, but I'm powerful. You sound, you sound like a likable person. I mean, like I said, it's like, you, it's intimidating, but in a in a respectful way, if that makes sense. You know, I think in a personally, I'm, I'm a lot better than I am romantically. I think that I'm a good friend and I think I'm a terrible partner and I stand by that. And you know, that's for another time. But, but I, when I show up to work, I'm going to, I'm going to get to damn work. I show up for my friends. I don't show up for my romantic partners. And I do stand by that. Is that, is that something you, 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 you want to do? Like you want to continue to not stand up for your romantic partners? You know, I, it's not something that I feel like I need to work on. You know, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm fine being a good friend and a bad partner. That's, that's, that's just who I am. Put that Listen, on, you, put that on my Tinder. Um, do you think it's harder to find work nowadays with, with your profession? Because it seems like your profession is like a niche. It's like, you know, not everybody can do this. Not everybody can do this correctly. Is it harder to find work nowadays? 
it's hard to find work. And I, I wanted to, I wanted to stay in a profession where I could still use a walkie. So actually I am running the Hollywood, uh, bus tours and I'm holding my walkie and I'm driving and I'm telling people all about the sites. So that way, you know, we're preserving, we're preserving an age old, age old tradition of using the walkie talkie because it kind of came and went. The, the walkie had its Harriet at the spy moment, but it, even walkies are on the outs. So, you mm-hmm. know, it is a dying profession, but I'm finding places where I can continue to survive. Something about the uh, Independence Day I wanted to talk to you about. Um, the, the scene where Jeff Goldblum was drunk and he's falling all over the place. He don't know what's going on. Oh, yeah. uh, the end of the world. Who cares? Oh, I got a coat. When he was moving around, I heard that was kind of improvised, the whole drunk movement and everything like that. And, you know, he's he's knocking stuff over, falling around. Um, when something like that happens, right, and it's like improvised, they don't really, they're just doing it because they're in them, they're in character. Right. Do you ever get worried where it's like, hey, don't you knock that fucking phone over? I- I'm in charge of that. Don't you break that phone. I'm so glad you brought that up, Kevin. It's an absolute disaster. But, you know, whatever the actor says and does goes. But, you know, you know, when they say everyone's safely back to one, well, okay, good luck with continuity. Good luck with continuity. It is hard to, to you know, retrace your steps and put mm-hmm. the phones where they go, the walkies where they go. I mean, and listen, a gorgeous performance. But if you look close, I'm sure there's some continuity errors because we couldn't barely keep up. Yeah, and I heard that was one like one of the people we interviewed was talking about the continuity error, errors, and I think it was because there's so much improvisation going on on, on the set that it's like we can't we can't do this because that this wasn't written, you know. So I can see that being a problem. Something I'm always saying is leave the improvisation at Second City, okay? Don't don't be bringing that into movies, okay? Stick to the script. By being like your job is based around phones, phone connecting, contacting. Let's do this. Let's talk. We gotta have the connect. Do you get tired of that when you're not at work? Like, like, like if you see it, like if I see another iPhone, I'm going to lose my mind. Is it anything like that? You know, I, I hear you there, but I think because, because I'm, I'm helping them handle it. I'm not really handling it much myself. I'm not spending a lot of time on the phone or on the screen very often. And I've got a myriad of hobbies in my outside life. I play cricket. I'm, I just started pickleball. So I don't really have a lot of time for the screens. I, you know, I've got a couple of dear close friends. I know their numbers by heart. But otherwise, you know I know numbers to, by heart. I know the numbers by heart because I don't have a cell phone. I don't have a cell phone myself. No, I've got a home phone, and that's it. Sheesh. Yeah, I've got a home phone with a thirty foot cord because I like to take my calls all over my house. Is is the, is the phone see through, or is it like? Yeah, it's, a, like it's a banana phone? phone. It's got it's banana shape. Oh, it's a banana phone, okay. Yeah, and then the, the bottoms appeal. It's adorable. It's really fun. I love I love an homage to the to the eighties and nineties. I, really I don't know. Love. I didn't I didn't tell you this and don't tell nobody else, you know what I'm saying? But I'm actually writing a screenplay. Oh, okay. Um, I've been trying to yeah, I've been trying to get trying to get better with writing and everything like that. And I wanna make something of myself outside of just being Andy's intern, right? That's fantastic. And, you know, they always say picking up the pen and starting to write the things the hardest part because your brain wants to get in the way and say your shit. Yeah, ex- exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so the, what I'm writing is, is a movie. It's, it's called Dial Tone, and it's, a, and it's a scary film. It's like a horror flick. And the way it works is if you answer the phone, like a phone a phone's calling, and you answer, it picks up, you hear a dial tone, uh-oh, you got 20 seconds, you're about to die. Uh-oh. Okay, so it's kind of like the ring, but much more expedite, expedited, a lot faster. Exactly. Oh, I, you know what? You know what's happening? The hairs on my arms are sticking up. That is really mm-hmm. spooks. That's got a lot. That's spooky. Yeah, so um, this has been one of the uh, best interviews I've ever had in my life. Um, oh my uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you again to uh, Roxanne Spam Can, who uh, I hate to say it, but well, I actually love to say it. She's my best friend now. <laughs> my Roxanne, best friend. I want to thank you for joining us today. And I want to thank you. And you know what? I'm going to send you my home phone number. I'm sending it right now. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Uh, what? Please enjoy the rest of the podcast. Thanks, Kevin. And thank you, Hannah. Our next chapter was novelized by Daniel Powell from Inside Amy Schumer, that damn Michael Che, and more, and narrated by Michael Torpy. Michael Torpy, novelize us. Chapter 18, President Maverick, novelized by Daniel Powell, narrated by Michael Torpy. Delivery complete. Engage, said General Gray, completely unaware that months from now, an actor named Robert Loja will appear on the talk show Politically Incorrect. 
and watch as host Bill Maher says that Loja's recent blockbuster hit about aliens is, quote, one of the stupidest movies I've ever seen. Loja, clearly agitated, tells Maher that he is stupid, in a moment that Maher will later call not one of my finest moments. But again, this was many months away, and instead of dwelling on future media interactions, General Gray was intently focused on the task at hand. In the cockpit of his F-18 Hornet, President Whitmore fired a lone missile. Eagle One, Fox Three, he cried as it propelled itself towards the alien ship. Months earlier, an actor named Bill Pullman read a screenplay about an alien invasion for consideration of a role. The line Eagle One, Fox Three did not appear in the script. It would be added later, probably by a military consultant, to help the film's dialogue sound more authentic. The missing line did not dissuade Pullman from accepting the role. His last film, Mr. Wrong, where he played the romantic lead opposite Ellen DeGeneres, was somehow a major flop, and he needed the work. But this was all in the past. In the present, there was a huge alien spaceship, and President Whitmore needed to blow it up. General Gray, the President, and all humans still alive held their breath as they watched the lone missile approach the alien ship. Come on, come on, come on, Whitmore whispered to the missile. But it didn't listen. Instead, it promptly collided with the ship's fully operational energy shield. In Central Command, military men in headsets shook their heads in disappointment. Virus ineffective, disengage, General Gray said with a straight face. Get your people out of there! Dozens of F-18 Hornets peeled off, but the President's jet stayed its course. Hold on, Command, I want another shot at it! Sir, I strongly recommend you disengage, General Gray barked. But the President was not to be dissuaded. After all, he was the Commander-in-Chief, which outranks a general. Eagle One, Fox Three, he exclaimed again, and this time it was a direct hit! There must have been some lag time between when the virus was uploaded to the alien mainframe and when the shield malfunctioned. Alien technology was truly a mystery. The unexpected explosion caused elation in the command center. That's a hit! Fire at will, said one of the headset men. We're going in. Squadron leaders, take point, the president directed. And his fellow pilots chimed in. Eagle five at three, said one, perhaps as an inside reference to Bill Pullman's flying RV in the movie Spaceballs, which was also called Eagle Five. This could also have just been a coincidence. They started firing many missiles. Even Russell joined in. Eagle 20, Fox 2, he yelled. Years later, an actor named Randy Quaid and his wife will be arrested for allegedly defrauding an innkeeper in Santa Barbara. The case will eventually be dismissed, but it still marks the beginning of a long downward slide for Randy Quaid. Sadly, Russell would not live to see this, but it was not his problem at the moment because a swarm of alien fighters were rushing in his direction. Evasive maneuvers, said the President of the United States, inside the fighter jet that he, the President of the United States, was personally flying to lead an attack against an alien armada. In spite of the alien's obvious technological advantages, the President nimbly picked off an enemy fighter. Russell joined in, easily vaporizing an alien craft that had crossed the void of interstellar space to attack our planet. Payback's a bitch, ain't it? Russell yelled to his vanquished enemy, perhaps as an ad lib. On the alien mothership, David and Steve were anxious to depart. Job's done. Let's go home, said David, referring to the planet Earth. Gladly, said Steve. But when he tried to maneuver the ship, it was unresponsive. Try it again, insisted David. As they bickered, the waxy manager of the alien's space garage noticed something was amiss. In the trailer park that used to be Area 51, alien ships descended and started firing. RVs of various makes and models exploded in the Nevada sun. Come on, come on, yelled Major Mitchell to Constance as he tried to usher her to safety. As they ran, there were many more explosions, some in slow motion, some in regular motion. Many people could be heard saying things like, Come on! or Look out! or Come on! again. Surely many of these anonymous people died, but Major Mitchell was able to get Constance out of danger. Back in the alien mothership, the suspicious space garage manager pressed a button on his screen, which, in spite of their advanced technology, had the resolution of a 1991 Atari Lynx. On David and Steve's ship, the windshield started retracting. What the hell are you doing, said Steve. It's not me, they're overriding the system, replied David. 
Suddenly, Steve and David found themselves face to face with the alien garage manager. Oh, shit. Um, hide, said David in a manner that could only be described as maximum gold bloom. Under Area 51, everyone was panicking about the chaos above. Moisha gathered a group of children in a prayer circle. Everybody hold someone's hand, he bellowed. Moisha even invited disgraced former Secretary of Defense Albert Nimziki to join them. Hashem Alaheinu, he said, praying in Hebrew. Moisha said some other things in Hebrew, but it has been many years since this novelizer's bar mitzvah and he's a little rusty on the uptake. I'm not Jewish, said Nimziki. Nobody's perfect, quipped Moisha. Years later, in Charlottesville, Virginia, white nationalists will gather for a rally where they declare Jews will not replace us while wielding tiki torches and various racist paraphernalia. After one counter-protester is killed and numerous others are injured, President Donald Trump will claim that there are very fine people on both sides. In the skies above Area 51, the president and his team of scrappy fighter pilots continued to fire missiles. Eagle 7, Fox 2, one yelled. Eagle 3, Fox 2, shouted another. One had to wonder just how many missiles they had left. We're running out of missiles, said one of the headset men in the command center. We're just not causing enough damage. It's settling directly over us. Sure enough, the giant alien ship hovered above Area 51. Very slowly, preparing to incinerate all remaining Americans. They're preparing to fire their primary weapon, exclaimed General Gray. Then let's take it out before it takes us out, said the president. Target at 12 o'clock. He and his wingmen raced towards the underbelly of the ship as alien fighters surrounded them. My God, they're everywhere, said one of the wingmen, perhaps thinking about how much this sequence owed to Star Wars. Meanwhile, the primary weapon on the Death Star, I mean the alien ship, continued to charge. You're out of time! You gotta disable it now! yelled General Gray. I'm in range, said President Fighter Pilot. Eagle One, Fox Two! But the missile was blocked by the primary weapon's blast doors. That is a negative impact. I'm out of missiles, he said. I'm on it, said his wingman, Eagle Seven. But he wasn't on it, because he was immediately evaporated by an alien fighter. Jesus, said the president. We are so fucked. He didn't say that last part out loud, but he was probably thinking it. In the command room, a headset man informed General Gray that all missiles had been fired. It sure seemed like humanity was done for. You're out of time. Get your ass out of there, said General Gray. Doesn't anyone have any missiles left, begged the president desperately. Sorry I'm late, Mr. President, chirped a voice from over the comm system. Kind of got hung up back there. An F-18 emerged clumsily from the fog of battle. Pilot, you armed? asked the commander-in-chief. Armed and ready, sir. I am packing, the voice replied. There was confusion in the command room. What kind of fighter pilot would use such unconventional jargon? Who is that guy? Put him on the speaker, barked General Gray. It's me, Russell Case, sir. I told you I wouldn't let you down. Years later, actor Randy Quaid and his wife will be charged with burglary after spending five days occupying the guest house in a vacant home they once owned in Santa Barbara. As with Gary Busey before him, Quaid's increasingly eccentric behavior will make it difficult for people to recall he was once an esteemed actor and had been nominated for an Academy Award. All right, boys, let's give Mr. Case some cover, said President Maverick. Let's plow the road! Russell bobbed and weaved through alien fighters, locking his missiles onto the primary weapon. I've got tone, he said. Eagle 20, Fox 2. But when he pressed the trigger, catastrophe. The missile malfunctioned. It's jammed, it won't fire. Damn it, said the president. But Russell had promised that he wouldn't let him down, and he made a grave decision. Do me a favor, he said. Tell my children I love them very much. If his missile wouldn't go to the aliens, Russell would bring the missile to them. All right, you alien assholes, Russell shouted. In the words of my generation, up yours! Good luck, buddy, said the president, which honestly seemed like a pretty unpresidential thing to say to a man seconds away from death by kamikaze. Maybe something more like, Godspeed, my friend. But I don't know, I'm not at liberty to change the dialogue, I'm just the novelizer. The primary weapon, which was taking longer to charge than an iPad 4, finally began to crackle and glow. 
Just as the glowing orb of death reached its climax, Russell's F-18 flew directly up into it, jamming the barrel or whatever. Hello, boys. I'm back, Russell said, even though the up yours from earlier really seemed like his final sign-off. But Russell's gambit worked. The laser, instead of going downward towards Earth, reversed course and went upward into the alien ship. Triumphant music swelled as explosions reverberated across the city killer. He did it! The son of a bitch did it! yelled the president. In the control room, headset men exploded with glee. All right! shouted General Gray. But there was one person who was notably not celebrating. Russell's son, Miguel. Major Mitchell noticed. What your father did was very brave. You should be proud of him, he said, putting a firm hand on Miguel's shoulder. I am, smiled Miguel. And just like that, he was over the death of his dad. The alien ship, now riddled with explosions, descended slowly into the Nevada landscape. The president and his remaining wingmen took a victory lap over the disabled craft. Now we know how to take him out, General. Spread the word. And that is all the alien invasions we have time for today. Until next time, Kevin, land this spaceship. Thanks, Andy. And thanks to this week's guest contributors, Tony Zaret, Daniel Powell, Michael Torpy, and Hannah Pilks. More info about all of our guests can be found in the show description. The Novelizer was created by Stephen Levinson, produced by Stephen, Chris Kowalski, Rob Kuttner, and Suchetta's Bokeel. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Chris. Improv booking by Christine Bullen. Music by Cole Emhoff. Art direction by Crystal Dennis. And illustrations by Barry Crane. Intro narration by Robin Reed and interviews by me, Kevin Carter. Special thanks to Luke Dennis and Peter Hayes at White Soul Public Radio in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Check out thenovelizers.com for more info about the show and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and occasionally TikTok. If you enjoyed The Novelizers, please support us on Patreon or email thenovelizers at gmail.com to sponsor an episode. Till next time, I'm Kevin Carter. Boo! <laughs>